the reason that you are so far away from me is because I am, I'm the most dangerous person here, yeah? I've just been traveling around to KL and everywhere, so I'm really dangerous. I'm like radioactive, so stay away from me. Yeah? <laughs> it is not just a joke, there's some truth to that. So, <laughs> so anyway, so welcome uh, everyone. And uh, the, uh, tonight's topic is a continuation of a topic that we had uh, last time I was here. That was in Vermont. When was that? Christmas? New Year's? Something like that? Yeah, New Year's. Okay, around the New Year's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually before. It doesn't matter. And that, at, at that time we talked about the idea of uh, dying, yeah, and kind of how to deal with death, especially our own mortality. Yeah. And then it was said that we should also talk about how to deal with other people's death, yeah, family members, friends, and all these kind of things. Because yeah. that is slightly different. Your own death is one thing. Yeah. Someone else close to you dying is actually something else. Yeah. And how we deal with these things is also, I mean, it's obviously very closely related to each other, but there is also a distinction between those things. Yeah. And it's useful to think about these things in slightly different ways. Yeah. So for that reason, I think it's a good idea to carry on, yeah? And uh, COVID, it being COVID-19 season is a good time to talk about uh, <laughs> these kind of issues anyway. Yeah. So it's good. I'm, I'm glad to see people in Singapore are pretty relaxed about these things because I, I went out today with your president, uh, Pang Hong, who went out, to, and uh, people were still having a good time, enjoying coffees and things together. Yes, yeah? so it wasn't, not taking it too seriously, which is, which is great. Uh, otherwise, you destroy your life by worrying about these things. Uh. So uh, when I want to start is to start by uh, one of those uh, very fundamental teachings of the Buddha is actually specifically about this. Uh, and one of the things the Buddha says there are certain themes that as human beings or anyone really we should reflect upon uh, on a regular basis, yeah? And often it is five different themes. And one of these themes is very, uh, the very simple idea that I will be separated uh, and uh, uh, basically separated uh, from everything that is dear and pleased to me in this, in this life. Uh, yeah, and this is one of the fundamental themes of reflection on the Buddhist path. I must be separated and uh, parted from everything dear and agreeable to me in this life. Uh, and this is exactly what this is about. Yeah? When someone dear to you is passing away, someone is sick, uh, someone dies and then you grieve and you feel depressed about it and all of these kind of things. Uh, this is exactly the purpose of this kind of reflection, uh, to get you, uh, you know, to understand this issue, what it is all about. Uh, it's a fundamental part uh, of the Buddhist path. Uh, and uh, so, uh, because of that, and it's not just that, but one of the other interesting things about this, uh, if you look at the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, yeah, the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path uh, has eight factors, uh, and the first factor is right view, right? Yeah, Samma Ditti, yeah. So the first one is right view. Now if you look at the definition how right view is taught throughout the suttas uh, as the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, it is always, it starts off by saying birth is suffering. Uh, then it says old age is suffering. Uh, then you have illness is suffering, COVID-19 is suffering. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't specifically say that, but I mean, you know, it's kind of implied. Yeah, and then it says it would have been pretty impressive if the Buddha said that. Uh, but and then it says death, death is suffering. Yeah? This is the beginning of right view, and it's kind of astonishing when you read that because you think it's bleeding obvious that these things are suffering. Why does the Buddha need to say these things? And of course, the reason why he needs to say these things because it is. On the one hand, is it is obvious, uh, but on the other hand, it is not. Uh, yeah, and this is the foundation of the entire spiritual path. And he talks about more things. He talks about separation from the liked, association with the dislike, not getting what you want, and all of these kind of things as well. But they are all in the same ballpark. Yeah, about separation and from the things that you love and you like in this world. Uh, it's all roughly about the same thing. Yeah, things that are obvious in one way, uh, but that we haven't really taken on board fully in another way. Yeah. And this is why it is so interesting. Yeah. And of course, once you have that right view, yeah, the next thing that happens, you start to get right intention. Yeah. And right intention really just means that you are having new goals in your life, new purposes, new aims. Your life is starting to change, change direction a little bit. Yeah. 
Yeah? And sometimes a lot, it changes the direction a lot uh, because you realize that there are some fundamental issues with life uh, that need to be resolved. And the only way you're going to resolve those uh, is by changing your aim and purpose in existence, in life. So it's a very powerful thing, this thing we call, you know, uh, right view. Uh, and that right view often comes about precisely when there is difficulties, when there are troubles in your life, yeah? The potential there, whenever there is a difficulty, there is some suffering in your existence, the potential of that suffering is that they can give rise to right view, right understanding. Yeah? That is the power. And as soon as you realize that, that you can kind of give rise to all this right view, and all this correct way of thinking about life from the difficulties that you have, once you realize that, it takes away some of the suffering straight away here, because you understand the potential that this difficult situation actually has for you to change how you think about everything and to move you in a better direction as a consequence. And once you think like that, it's not so bad anymore. Yeah, already it kind of lightens some of the burden because you understand there is a possibility here which is very profound and very deep. In fact, it is so profound and deep and I made this point here before, I think maybe a couple of years ago or something, uh, it is so profound and deep that uh, if you look at the life of the Buddha before he became the Buddha, the reason why the Buddha, the Buddha-to-be became the Buddha was precisely because he reflected on death and dying and these issues in a very deep way. Uh, yeah? if you, I don't know if you... Some of you will know this, but if you go back to the Buddha's life story, uh, where he talks about the things that he did as he started out, uh, he always starts out by saying, I recognize that I was subject to illness, I am subject to old age, I am subject to death, and yet I go out into the world and search for all of these other things that are subject to exactly the same thing. Yeah. And that was kind of his breakthrough moment uh, when he decided to become a monk. He decided to go forth, uh, and that is what led to Buddhism. That's why we are here today. Yeah, so that is the power of this reflection. It's extremely powerful. So when you are, have a problem in your life, that is the potential outcome of those problems. If you use them wisely, uh, yeah, if you reflect properly about these problems, uh, you will gradually move in this direction. Uh, and of course, the ultimate result of that uh, is the highest happiness in the world. Uh, that is the ultimate outcome of those things. Uh, so very, very interesting. So uh, already, yeah, if you tell people this, people think, oh yeah, that's actually pretty, pretty cool. Yes, maybe I should be happy that I get sick. Yeah, uh, maybe you should. Yeah, maybe this is kind of, you turn things the other way around. Maybe you should be happy sometimes. Well, sometimes uh, you meet with these disastrous things uh, and they turn out to be massive blessings in disguise. Uh, but uh, let's come back to earth again. Yeah? But now we've already taken off to the yeah, bang, highest level already. So let's kind of bring things back to a little bit to reality. We need to, people are on so many different stages in the spiritual practice. Uh, some have been Buddhists and been practicing for a long time uh, and they are able to deal with kind of really profound concepts and things. Uh, other people are much more basic in their understanding, yeah? So how do we start from the very basics? If someone is getting into very serious trouble uh, and uh, having all kinds of problems in their life, how do we actually deal with that in a very simple way? Uh? And this is where Ajahn Brahm's stories come in very handy, yeah? They are very, very, very useful. Uh? And one of the things about these stories by Ajahn Brahm is that they have so many different levels to them. Uh? Yeah, they are, on the one hand, they're very entertaining, especially when Ajahn Brahm tells them, not as entertaining when I tell them, but when Ajahn Brahm tells them, they're really, really entertaining. And so they have an entertainment value, but they also have an immediate spiritual value, but they have an intermediate spiritual value, and then they have a very profound spiritual value. So these are the stories you can use yeah, for yourself and also for others to kind of get started with this dealing with these difficult issues, grief, depression, despair, and these kind of things in your life. Yeah. And of course, one of the really basic ones is the idea of this too will pass. Yeah, it's such a simple teaching. Yeah, yeah it's such a, uh, and, and yet uh, it is necessary to tell people this again and again and again uh, because we forget that this too will pass. Uh, 
when you are really grieving, if you are really depressed, it tends to feel permanent. Yeah? It tends to feel that you are stuck in this. You can't see any way out. And because you can't see any way out, that is exactly why it feels permanent. And this comes from the sense of self. We tend to uh, project uh, that sense of self into these negative feelings. Uh, and then they uh, be feel like permanent uh, as, a, as a consequence. Uh, so just a reminder that this too will pass. Uh, yeah? And if you have some idea of uh, the nature of things, uh, some idea that this obviously must be true, uh, then it will carry, that will be enough to carry you through. Uh, it will be enough to kind of come out of the other side, uh, see the light at the other, uh, other end of the tunnel, uh, and then uh, you, will ca you, you won't actually do anything very stupid on the way, such as uh, you know, committing suicide or doing some other stupid act as a consequence. Uh, very simple teaching, uh, but also actually very profound at the same time. Uh, one of the other stories of Ajahn Brahm, stories like Good, Bad, Who Knows. I'm sure you have all heard the story Good, Bad, Who Knows many times before. Is anyone here who does not know the story Good, Bad, Who Knows? Everyone knows the story Good, Bad, Who Knows. Probably too many times already. So I'll just tell it in very short form, the story Good, Bad, Who Knows. And the story is the story about this king who gets his finger cut off, yeah, and his doctor cuts off the finger. And uh, the doctor is kind of seems like a bit of a kind of callous guy. He always says good, bad, who knows to the king. Yeah, I don't know, good, bad, who knows, cut off the finger. Okay, off to jail you go. He chucks his doctor into jail. And then later on, the king goes into the, on a hunting trip. And on this hunting trip, he get, gets caught by this savage cannibals. Yeah, this kind of classic comic book savage cannibals. And he gets tied to a kind of a, a, a post or something, and they're going to kill him because they're going to make a sacrifice of this king. So they can kind of make their gods happy. And then at the last moment, one of the cannibals says, but he's missing a finger. We can't sacrifice an imperfect human being to our gods. Our gods will be, not be happy if we sacrifice an imperfect being. All the fingers have to be there. Okay, king, you can go. And then, of course, the king goes back to his doctor and says, Doctor, thank you. You are my favorite doctor. You are the most wonderful. Come out of prison. We will give you a big bonus or whatever. Yeah? And uh, then uh, you know, the, and the doctor says, as usual, good, bad, who knows. Uh, but uh, the point of that story is that uh, it's, it's, it's a nice story. But of course, the point is that outcomes are so uncertain. Uh, yeah? It looks like things are, are really, really bad. You lose a finger. Actually, it's not such a big deal to lose a finger anyway. We have one of our disciples in Perth, he has half a finger there, quarter finger missing there, another finger, and it's perfectly, seems to be perfectly okay. So it can't be that bad. <laughs> and, but uh, the point is that, uh, you know, the, the short-term outcome of things, the, or the medium-term outcome, sometimes things turn out very differently. Yeah. And in the deeper sense, if you use these lessons in a really wise way, they turn out radically differently. Yeah. And this is why Buddhism could even arise in the world from someone using these lessons in a very, very profound way. And of course, that was the Buddha himself. So that, this is a story that has so many levels, yeah. And if you go to someone who is grieving, who is in despair, who is having a really hard time, and you tell them, good, bad, who knows, they will probably get the idea to some extent, yeah? Because it is kind of obvious. And then you tell them a funny story, and you have a joke, and then kind of you're on the right track already. Yeah. Another one of Ajahn Brahm's very famous stories is the truckload of dung. Yeah, I'm sure you all know the truckload of dung story. A truckload of dung is uh, uh, someone has a house, and they have a garden on the outside, and then in the middle of the night, a big truck comes. Yeah, you are not even at home. You are away somewhere. You have no idea the truck is coming. And the trap, truck dumps a large load of dung in your garden. Uh, yeah, you, what do you do? Do you get upset if that happens? Do you kind of, kind of do, what, what do you do? So that's, you, most people get upset. Yeah? Most people get angry. They get uh, uh, even depressed. Yeah? You don't want to have a big truck, a lot of dung in your garden. Uh, but of course, the answer to that, and this is kind of the beautiful thing, uh, to take that dung, uh, dig it into your garden uh, to help your plants to grow. Uh, and then eventually, you get a very beautiful garden. Uh, this is exactly the same thing again. The truckload of dung is in our life. Uh, are the things that lead to depression and sadness and all those, those kind of things. Uh, if we use them wisely, if we use them unwisely, it's going to be problematic. Uh, but if you use them wisely, they're going to be a massive boost for growth in your life. Uh, and they're going to make an enormous difference uh, in how you 
uh, deal with things, uh, and eventually they may come, you know, come around to something very powerful and very beautiful. Huh? So this is the starting point, yeah? This is the very beginning of how to deal with these problems. Uh, and don't underestimate these simple stories. Uh, they're actually very profound. I always think it's a shame, you know, people, Ajahn Brahm tells these stories uh, and people laugh and they have a good time uh, and they forget often the profound meaning of these things. Uh, they're very, very profound uh, and they go a long, long way if you use them wisely. Uh, so reflect on them in a proper way. Uh, then uh, it's really going to make a difference in your life. Uh, Still, we want to take it a bit deeper, yeah? It's not really enough, especially if you are serious about Buddhist practice and the spiritual path. Uh, you want to take it a bit deeper than this. And uh, uh, very often in life, it is like uh, sometimes we need to be hit by these things before we wake up, uh, yeah? When you are hit by something very powerful and difficult, uh, bang, then actually things happen. Uh, ideally, we don't want to be hit by these things. Ideally, we want to understand this from the outset, uh, so we don't have to go through all the suffering before we learn. Uh, but in reality, often we have to be hit by these things uh, before we really learn the problem and learn the lesson, and then change our mind and move in a different direction. Uh, yeah, and then gradually we kind of head, head there. So if you are the kind of person who is having problems or you're not having problems, yeah, the idea is if you understand that these things are problematic, yeah, then the very first thing we should always do is to start to understand the power of the Buddhist teachings uh, to give us a sense of uh, um, way out of these things. Uh. Yeah, so come back to these uh, teachings. Don't allow life to become so important to you. Yeah, the enjoyment of life and all that stuff is so kind of, you get so caught up in the enjoyment uh, that you forget the reality of life. Uh, because if you forget the reality of life, then it's going to hit you far, 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 far worse than it otherwise would. Uh. So use the times when you are happy, when things are going well, to learn Dhamma to understand what it's about, to do some meditation practice, to let go a little bit of the world outside of you, to build up a good heart and all of these things. This is the time to do it. Yeah? And then you build up something there which becomes very useful for the future. So come back to these teachings again and again, understanding that there is a problem here, there's an issue that actually will hit you down the track. That is the ideal way of doing this. Yeah? Because you have that understanding there. Because uh, these teachings are there, basically, the purpose of the Buddha's teaching is to overcome suffering. Uh, and this is obviously a very important part of the suffering. Uh, and as you keep on developing these things, it is weird. You kind of gradually emerge from the swamp of suffering and problems, and problems in your life merely by listening to the teachings, uh, by allowing them gradually to penetrate inside uh, and to make a big difference. Uh, so this is how it kind of gradually emerged from. This is the ideal way of dealing with this. You build up the things outside before the problems arise. Yeah? And then you will be on the right track. Yeah? But uh, what I want to talk about now is some more specific ways of dealing with uh, uh, grief, yeah, dealing with problems, someone dies, someone is very sick, yeah. some more kind of direct, immediate, practical advice. I mean, this is very practical already, but maybe some kind of immediate ideas how to think about this. Yeah. And one of the uh, uh, surprisingly simple ways of thinking about, uh, especially death, yeah, also when someone gets very sick because that reminds you of death, uh, one of the kind of obvious ways of thinking about this uh, is to remember the Buddhist idea of rebirth. Yeah? So what rebirth means is that uh, uh, if someone else dies from you, uh, or they are about to die from you, uh, very often the reality is that we will often meet again in future lives. Uh, yeah? It is not as if uh, the reason why death often seems so terrible, because it seems like such an absolute end. Yeah? This is the end, it's like a wall shutting you away from somebody else. Uh, but actually, it isn't really like that. Uh, there's a tendency for humans to meet in one life and then meet in the next one again. Uh, and you may have heard many of these kind of stories. I mean, we hear these stories all the time. Yeah? People get reborn, they have an uh, out-of-body experience or a near-death experience, and then you meet kind of relatives uh, yeah, in some kind of higher realm somewhere. Uh, it's a very common 
uh, thing that people have when they have this kind of experience, isn't it? Not really religious experience, atheists have exactly the same experience. And the, the reason why this happens is because we have certain attachments. And when you have certain attachments and you have similar kind of kamma, yeah, kamma is what drives you then on from one life to the next one, uh, that attachment will tend to draw us together in the future. Uh. So sometimes we grieve without really understanding that actually maybe it won't be that long before we meet up again. Uh. Yeah, okay, bye-bye mum, bye-bye dad, bye-bye daughter or son or whoever it is. Uh, but uh, see, perhaps we'll see you again soon. Uh. And that takes away so much of the uh, problem. Yeah? It's, it's more like taking a holiday apart uh, than it is a final barrier between two people. Uh. And this is the Buddhist idea of rebirth. So if you take the idea of rebirth seriously, well, you can assume that this actually is going to be some truth to that. Uh. And the nice thing about that idea is that it also works for other religions as well. So if you have friends who are Christians or Muslims or whatever, because they often have an idea of a heavenly realm, you can even help them, yeah? And you can maybe even help people who are free thinkers, free thinkers who believe in rebirth. Are there any of those? <laughs> free thinking rebirth, that's, that's, I think that's pretty, yeah, that's okay. Lots of atheists in the world who believe in rebirth, apparently. So it's okay, you can be an a atheist and believe in rebirth, very quite common these days. And then you can use this idea to think, okay, Holiday apart. What does holiday apart mean? Well, according to the old English saying, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah? So you get a kind of a few, a few, a little bit of time apart, and then when you meet again, yay, you know, now we can meet again, even better than before. That's kind of the idea. It's a very simple thing. It's not very profound. Yeah? It's very kind of, it's a starting block kind of thing. But it's enough to give you a little bit of a kind of immediate, um, uh, immediate let, letting go of the heartache a little bit straight away. That is kind of the idea behind these kind of things. Yeah, Simple and basic, but still very useful. Huh? So try that with people. And sometimes people who haven't had much contact with Buddhism or spiritual life, uh, they will be able to relate to these kind of things. Huh? But then we need to take it a little bit deeper. Huh? And uh, the next level is really to uh, remember that uh, what really matters in life is not how long we live, but the quality of life that we have. Yeah? What kind of person we have been. These are the things that really matter in life. So very often it is about remembering the good qualities in other people. Yeah? And then to rejoice if someone has had a good life. And one of the great things about being part of a, uh, the Buddhist fellowship is that there are a lot of good people in a place like this. Uh, so when someone here is in trouble, someone here gets sick, uh, it's not difficult to rejoice in the goodness of what they have been doing. Uh, and there's something very transformative that happens when you rejoice in someone's goodness, in their good qualities, uh, yeah? and you think, wow, you have lived really well, well done. Yeah? You can pass on, you don't have to be too much too concerned about it because it's good anyway. Uh, it has this transformative feeling. Instead of focusing on the sadness, which is the loss, instead you focus on the good things in that person's life. And it becomes an exercise in gratitude. Yeah, Gratitude for a person well-lived has been there in your life. And what a wonderful thing that is when you can transform it in that way. And this was what happened to me to a large extent because I... As I mentioned here last time when I was here, my uh, father passed away. It's almost a year ago now, not quite, 11 months ago or something. Yeah. And uh, I knew he was going to die. Yeah? He was kind of, his cancer was getting worse and worse, and it was only a matter of time. Uh, but you never know exactly when someone is going to die. But you have a feeling it's going to happen sooner. And uh, so I decided, well, this is what I have been trained to do as a monk. This is what I tell everyone else to do, so I should probably do it myself as well. Uh, so what I did, and uh, it was only a few weeks before he died, uh, I wrote, decided to write him a long letter. Uh, and in this letter, I kind of summarized all the qualities of my father that really inspired me. Uh, yeah, he, in many ways, he was a very good man. He wasn't perfect, of course, but he was in many ways a very, very good man. Uh, and I spent most of my life uh, finding faults with my parents, like many, many people do. Uh, but then when I sat down and tried to write out all, all the good qualities, I couldn't stop. 
Yeah. Eventually I had to stop because I couldn't read that far. It was too much to read it. So, okay, I better stop now. It, was only, <laughs> it wasn't that long, but you know what I mean? And I carried on and carried on. And then you write it up very nicely, and then I read it out. And I thought, wow, this is a far more precise description of my father than all the fault finding I've been doing over all these years. And then I uh, typed it into the computer and fired it off as a long email. And it was very powerful because it actually, when a father or a parent gets to hear something like that from their child, they're not used to that. Yeah, a child-parent relationship can often be quite difficult and hard. There can often be clashes, there will be arguments and all kinds of things. But when your son tells you suddenly about all your good qualities, all that you have valued, and you tell it in a way which is heartfelt, in a way which is properly structured, all coming together, it really touches a parent's heart. And I could feel that. I spoke to my father on the phone. I knew that somehow he had been touched by this. It wasn't obvious it was going to be the case, but it was obvious when I spoke to him afterwards. And that is good for the person who is dying, but it's also really good for the person who is behind. Yeah, for myself, because then I felt I had kind of resolved all the issues. Everything that was there, which wasn't kind of done with. Now I had said those things I really wanted to say to my father. I had said at that time, through that letter to him. And uh, very, so it was a very, very, very useful thing. And then when my father died, only a few weeks later, it was actually more or less by accident, it was so close together, a few weeks later, it wasn't, for me, it was actually quite easy. It was easy to let go. I felt I had done everything I could to make that thing be easy and nice. So take the opportunity. Take the opportunity to show that you care yeah, with people around you. And very often, we don't need to wait till someone is sick or dying. We can do it all the time. And because we are all subject to sickness and dying at any time, really. So now is the chance to show that you really care for someone else. So that, was, that reminded me. And then my sister, she only died a few months later. And of course, I repeated the exercise. Yeah? And, and, I mean, I had been trying to do these things for many years already, but now I got really, really serious about it. And that was really the difference. And in both cases, it was extremely successful. And now, what am I left with? I'm left with a very fond memory of my father and sister as good people who lived well, who didn't waste their life with just nonsense and stupidity. But they actually did things in the right way. And what a wonderful thing it is to have that memory. So this is how you then can change things around yeah, and lessen some of those uh, burdens. So people feel guilt sometimes. If you do that kind of thing, you will never feel any guilt or shame or anything bad about it whatsoever. Why? Because you have done your duty. You've done what you need to do to kind of get these things sorted out. And uh, it, is, yeah, it, really, it really does work. So that is... Um, part of that, yeah? So you shift your attitude around and you start to then feel a sense of gratitude to people. Instead of thinking about yourself, one of the problems with grief and sadness when someone dies is that it is a little bit, you know, it is really a bit selfish, yeah? This is the problem with it. And uh, once you understand that it is a bit selfish, because who are you really concerned with? Well, not so much with a dying person, you're concerned with your own grief. You're concerned with the fact that your life is going to be more empty without them. You may think that you're concerned about them, but actually you're not, but that's not really true. If you think about it very carefully, it is your problem that you are concerned with. And once you get that, once you see that actually you're being a bit selfish, then it takes away some of the uh, nobility of the sorrow. The sorrow isn't very noble anymore. Yeah? And if you take away some of the nobility, you have more... Uh, motivation to get away from that and move in a different direction when you understand that really it is really about you and when it is too much about you actually it is not so interesting anymore. Huh? So uh, these little things uh, can, be, can be useful. Huh? There's another story, another way of thinking about this thing that this is a story that uh, uh, I tell at funeral services, and Ajahn Brahm tells it. I, I actually got it from Ajahn Brahm originally, but I kind of changed it a little bit. So we, you know, you learn from your teacher, and you adapt, and you move on, and you make it worse or better. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, so, and this is, uh, you know, when someone has passed away, actually, how do we make that shift from uh, being sad to being having gratitude instead? Uh, 
And uh, Ajahn Brahm gives the simile of you go to a concert. Yeah, when you go to a concert, a, a beautiful concert, and you it doesn't have to be a concert, it can be maybe you go on a holiday overseas, yeah, or you go to some kind of maybe theaters, you see something which is special. It can be a meditation experience as well, which really, anything which lifts you out of your ordinary life, and you see something special, and you feel afterwards, wow, that was really, really powerful. Yeah, my ordinary life is so boring compared to these kind of special um, situations that you get into. And then uh, afterwards, after this uh, wonderful experience you have, uh, you come back to your ordinary life here in Singapore, yeah, a little bit stressful, your same old job, the same old apartment or whatever it is, and you think, yeah, and, and then you can choose, yeah? The choice is, well, I had this beautiful experience in my life. Either I can now be depressed and sad because I lost that beautiful experience. I came to Jhana Grove and had this marvelous meditation experience. When will I get it again? And as soon as you think that, you never get it back again. Anyway, so, or I went, I went to this beautiful holiday overseas. I heard this beautiful uh, symphony orchestra, whatever it is. And now I have to live this ordinary life. And you can feel depressed because you lost something that gave you a very special kind of uplift in your life. But uh, that is when you look at the loss. But there's another way of thinking about that. And that is the thought, this is my ordinary life. If I didn't have those special uplifting moments, if this is everything I had, this ordinary gray, kind of grayish life, yeah, kind of the same old routine all the time, my life would be so much more poorer. I would have this incredibly poor life if I never had any of these special things. And when you think like that, you start to have gratitude towards the experience, yeah? Thank me, thank my friends, thank everyone who made it possible for me to have this special experience. And you feel a sense of gratitude, and you feel a sense of uplift that you had the opportunity. And you can see where I'm going here. It's the same thing with people. Yeah? Either we feel sad because they're gone, because we feel the loss or whatever, or we feel a sense of gratitude for having had someone in our life who made a difference, who added something to us, who gave us something to think about, yes, who gave us some wisdom or whatever it is that they gave us. And you feel a gratitude. Thank you for being part of my life. Thank you for adding something to this existence which would have been so much poorer without your taking part in my life. And then you move away from grief and you move to a sense of gratitude. Yeah? And then this is a very beautiful way of transcending some of the sorrows and the problems in life. It's not going to be instantaneous. Yeah? It takes a bit of practice and training, but gradually you move in that direction. And then things become far less bad as a consequence. So these are a few ways of dealing with grief. Now, the next one is one I've already touched on uh, slightly before, uh, and that is the idea that uh, to be able to deal with any difficulties in life depends on your resilience. Uh, how resilient are you as a person? Uh, now, that resilience depends on your uh, kind of mental, uh, your mental world, yeah? how strong you are mentally, your ability to deal with these kind of things. Uh, so how do we build up that ability? And the way we build up that ability uh, is to create qualities inside of yourself uh, that are independent of uh, the troubles of the world. Uh, yeah, The troubles of the world are always going to be there. We're always going to lose things, they're always going to be there. But your ability to deal with it depends on the qualities you have built up inside of yourself. Uh, so if you have strong qualities, uh, if you have inner contentment, uh, if you have a sense of access to an inner joy sometimes that you can find, uh, if you have an inner peace that you have gained through your meditation practice, uh, if you have a wisdom about the world, uh, if you have compassion for the people around you, uh, if you have built up all of these things yeah, to some extent, uh, and this is very much part and parcel of what the spiritual path is about, uh, then when the problems come, uh, you will have the resilience to deal with them. Uh, you're still going to be sad, you're still going to be difficult to deal with, but far less difficult to deal with if you didn't have those qualities there to support you at that time. So this is why it is so important to start early. Yeah? Don't wait. Know that this is in store for every one of us. Start from the moment you are born. Yeah? Come out kind of straight away, do an act of kind generosity straight away. Okay, give them a little bit of time, but you know. And because you want to get going straight away, you can't, you can't mess around with this. And then, uh, so 
this is why it is so nice and nice to see young people who have some idea of the spiritual path. Because it's quite hard often when you're young, because you're young, you're strong, you kind of go and enjoy yourself in the world. It's quite hard to realize the importance of these things. But there are some people who are young who are very mature, who are ready, yeah? and they will actually get it from a very early age that this is important. The Buddha, of course, being one of those. So build up that resilience. That is what you're doing now. Come back to these teachings. yeah. And you're not only building up resilience, you're building up everything, of course. You're building up your whole life. And then, when these things happen, you will be ready for it. <clears throat> so that is another way of thinking about this. Another way of thinking about grief and sadness and to kind of help you to deal with these issues is just to remember at all times how fragile life actually is. And this is this precisely the idea of this kind of contemplation, yeah? the idea that everything that is dear and pleasing to me must be separated from me. It is remembering the fragility of existence. Yeah, it is so uncertain. This body that you have, how reliable is it? It's pretty unreliable. Yeah, there's probably illnesses in here right now. There's things going on. How long is it going to last? I don't mean to make you depressed, I just mean to make you kind of realistic about this. This body is so complex. Well, I mean, if you look at some of the doctors around here, what happened to the doctors? They have, <laughs> yeah, body is so complex. There's kind of all these blood vessels, tiny ones going everywhere. There's all these nerves going through the body. Yeah, there's, there's uh, all these organs stacked together. There's a lymphous system. It's just amazing it even functions at all. I'm always surprised that it even works at all, this body, being so incredibly complex as it is. It's a miracle. So I, I feel like I could die any second, pretty much. Uh, because of the, the complexity of this body. <laughs> Isn't that true, Kim? The body is super duper complex. Yeah? All this, and every cell is working. Yeah? Every cell is like a little engine kind of you know, producing nut burning nutrients and oxygen and what have you. It's just so remarkable. I, it's just uh, hard to imagine. And when you kind of get into this idea of the vulnerability of life, uh, how incredibly vulnerable we all are, how fragile everything is, uh, yeah? you start to care more. Uh, you start to care for the people around you because you know they are fragile. And this beautiful simile that was always spoken by Ajahn Shah, apparently. I mean, I, I wasn't there, I wouldn't know, but Ajahn Brahm always tells this story. The beautiful simile when Ajahn Shah takes a glass, yeah, a cup, and he holds it up. You've probably heard this many times before, but it's a nice story. Here. He holds it up, this glass, perfect glass. And he says to the audience, a large audience of monks and lay people, he says, do you see the crack in that glass. What do you mean, crack in that glass? Are you nuts? Ajahn Shah is a perfect glass. And Ajahn Shah said, there is a crack in that glass. And the reason there is a crack in that glass is because a glass is fragile. And because a glass is fragile, one day it's going to fall down on the ground. Yeah, on a, not, maybe not this, this ground is too soft, maybe, but concrete on the concrete ground. And the moment it falls down on a concrete ground, it's going to shatter into a thousand pieces. That's what glasses do when they fall on, concrete, on a concrete floor. So the crack is already there. It's already waiting to fall apart at any time. And the point is, of the simile, is that because you know the crack is already there, you care for the glass. You put it down gently. That's why you have this beautiful little soft thing here, yeah? So the, the cup doesn't crack when I put it down. Actually, I forgot about drinking my tea. That's a, that's a good, good point. <coughs> that's, that's dukkha. Mm. Oh, that's much better already, yeah. <laughs> so you care for the glass. You care for the cup. You put it down on a soft surface uh, and you look after it properly, yeah? In the same way, when we understand the fragility of human life, we care more for each other. We know that we could die at any time. We know how easily we can get sick. We know how quickly this body can you know, succumb to all kinds of problems and cancers and heart disease and whatnot. And because of that, we look after each other more. And this is kind of the radical outcome of understanding the impermanence of things, of understanding illness and death. We become better human beings. You get kinder hearts, because that is what actually is the outcome of this. If you know a person could die tomorrow, how are you going to treat them? If you know you're never going to see someone again, how will you treat them? 
you will treat them in a different way, uh, with more care, with, in a, with a different kind of attitude. Uh, and this is really one of the beautiful outcomes uh, of thinking about death and thinking about illness in the right way. It makes you a better person. Uh. And one of my favorite similes in Buddhism that brings this out beautifully, it's a simile I use all the time because I, I like it so much, uh, and that is the simile of the borrowed goods. Uh, Borrowed goods, borrowed things, according to the Buddha, almost everything we have in our life, actually everything we have in our life, is borrowed. We don't really own it. Yeah, we th it feels like we own stuff, but actually it's an illusion. Everything we have is borrowed. We only have it for a time. Then we're going to have to give it up. And this is true also for our family members, our friends, all the people around you, all the BF members, Ajahn Brahm, the Buddha, everything yeah, is like that. All these borrowed goods. So if things are borrowed goods, how do you, what is your attitude? Your attitude starts to change. Yeah? If you think about yourself, if you have a car that you own compared to a car that you have rented, what is the difference in your attitude to the car you own compared to the car you have rented? It's quite different, isn't it? If someone kind of rams into you and dents your car, if it's your car, you get, probably get really upset. Somebody dented my car. Wow, that's terrible. It's my car. They have no right to dent my car. But if you dent a rental car, you, you might not like it, but you're going to shrug your shoulders mostly. It's not such a big deal. It's a very different attitude. So the idea is that we remember everything in life is rented. Everything in life is temporary. So you look after the rental car, you don't treat it badly because you are a good person with uh, sensible morals and all of that. So you treat it well, uh, but you know how to deal with it in such a way as not to get atta too attached to it, uh, not to hold on too strongly because you're only renting it for a short while. Uh. So the idea is to move your perception gradually over to the idea that everything in your life is borrowed. Yeah? Everything is temporary here. It means you attach a little bit less. But not only do you attach less, through that lessening of attachment, you also care more. And that is the magic. More caring, less attachment in one go. That is really what is so powerful here. And this then goes for your family members. Yeah, it goes for your work colleagues. It goes for your BF colleagues. It goes for me. You're going to be kind to me as well. No, actually, you are. There's no problem there. It goes for everyone. Yeah, everyone coming together in this way. And this is the magic about thinking about these things the right way. It makes you better, wiser, more, uh, more suited person to live this life in a good way. Yeah? And as you do that, you change your attitude towards what really matters. Uh, I'm not going to talk all that much more, but I'm going to tell you one story, which is one of my favorite stories. And I've known about this for a long period of time, uh, but it's taken me a long time to really understand what this is about. Uh, yeah? And uh, this is, this is going to be my final kind of what I say tonight before I uh, we can do some Q&A or whatever. Um, but um, this is about uh, a thing that happened at Bodhinyana Monastery in 1991. That was before I got there, about three and a half years before I arrived at Bodhinyana Monastery. And this was when we had a big fire coming through the monastery. Have you heard about the big fire we had at Bodhinyana Monastery? It was a massive fire. It was one of the hottest, it was the hottest day at that time in, in Perth. It never been so hot before, 46 point something degrees, yeah? 46 is really, really hot, especially no humidity, it's the blaring sun, yeah, really super duper hot. And it was uh, on the 30th of January, so it was already well into the summer, yeah, this is the summer in the southern, southern hemisphere, so it's all in January, February when you have the summertime, so it was way into the summer, everything was really dry, yeah, ready to burn really fast, and then there was strong wind, strong wind fans the flames, that makes it worse. This was just about the worst possible conditions you could have. And right then, during those worst possible conditions, a fire co comes up. I'm not sure if it was lit or what, what happened. It's uncertain how these fires start sometimes. But a fire started just downwind from the monastery, yeah? and maybe an hour or so away, and then moving towards the monastery here. Yeah? And this was a time, 1991, was a time when Ajahn Brahm had spent the previous eight years, like he came there in uh, the start of the monastery in 83 November, so it would have been maybe seven and a half years or something. And uh, uh, so he had spent his whole time 
building up the monastery. Yeah, and he worked really, really hard. Ajahn Brahm is this amazing person. He, I don't know, he seems to be able to do everything. Yeah, he, he can build houses, he can meditate, he can do physics. I don't know how he does it. He can read Pali. It's just a, <laughs> he's kind of an extraordinary person. But so he, he built this monastery. He was basically the builder. Yeah, and sometimes you have this, you have to sign a paper who is the builder. Some of these papers had signed Ajahn Brahm on the bottom. He literally was the builder yeah, of the monastery. <laughs> So uh, and uh, some of the things it did were absolutely crazy. There's a, there's a you know the, one of the things it did. You many of you have been to Perth, yeah? You know what it's like down there. We have the main hall, and the main hall you have the apex. You have the roof going up, yeah? And the very apex where the roof meets at the top is maybe eight nine meters above ground. Yeah, it's pretty high. It's really really high up there. Yeah. And uh, so the, the the whole thing was finished. All that whole wall was finished. There was no roof, or anything like that. So the whole wall was just really shaky, like this. Uh, and it was all finished except for the very top bricks. Yeah, there was maybe six or seven bricks at the top that hadn't been laid. And then Ajahn Brahm, this was when he was still a little bit slimmer than he is now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more fit than he is these days. So he so he took seven bricks in one hand. A, a bucket of mortar, yeah, in the other hand, together with a little trowel to kind of smear the mortar, or whatever. Then he walks up this incline, and there's nothing on either side. There's a straight down on either side, but because it's bricks, it's like a nice ladder. You have to go walk up. He walks up to the top. He lays those bricks on the top. Yeah, basically, he's risking his life. That's the reality. Lays the bricks and then comes down again. And that's what he did. That was kind of the his commitment to the monastery. Yeah, it was one hundred and. Uh, how many percent? Way over 100 percent, I think. That's that's going way too far in what normally what you should do. Any if any kind of a, a health inspector or whatever work safety inspector had seen him, they would have kind of fired him straight away. It was completely complete madness what he was doing here. And uh, I would have probably fainted because I don't really like heights very much. I probably would have it would have been really really bad news for me. Here. But that, that was his commitment, yeah. And he had worked often 10 hours a day, seven days a week year in, year out, to build up that monastery. Basically, it was his work and his job. And now comes this fire. yeah. And when this fire gets very close, there comes a point, because the fire brigade is there, because they know that this is really, really dangerous. There comes a point when the fire brigade says, there's no hope anymore. Huh? Yeah? There's no chance, nothing we can do about this. We're going to have to evacuate. And so they evacuate, they get into their cars, they drive out of the monastery. And at that moment, Ajahn Brahm told me, at that moment, uh, I knew the monastery was going to burn down. Or he thought the monastery was going to burn down. Yeah? He, because everyone was saying the fire was so bad, the fire brigade was so unambiguous about it. Uh, yeah? The monastery is going to burn down. And uh, so what was his reaction when the monastery was going to burn up. This is the interesting part, yeah? This is what is really interesting, because this is like having attachment to things. You spent so many years building everything up. And he said, what happened? At that moment, I knew it was going to burn down, he said. At that moment, I just let go, and I was ready to start from scratch the following day. Yeah? Isn't that kind of astonishing? I, when I heard that, I was really astonished, because... Uh, you, usually, when we think about the superpowers of, you know, of in the suttas, it's like flying through the air or whatever, but this to me is even more of a superpower. How can you put your whole life into something, let it go like that, and then start from scratch again the following day? How is that possible? And so I asked Ajahn Brahm, how was that possible? How could you do that? Almost everyone else in the whole world would be devastated. Your life's work is in ruins. Yeah? Or your baby, everything you have lived for for those years, suddenly it's all gone. How are you able to let go so fast and start again the following day? This to me was just like a, it was almost like a miracle when I heard that. And then he told me why. He said, because I was never focused on the result. I didn't do this to get the monastery. I didn't do this to kind of build up something very special. I did it because it was a good thing to do. I did it as an act of charity, an act of generosity. The process was what mattered. Yeah, How I did it, to help, to be of assistance, to do something good in the world. That's why I did it. The result was not the point. And because the process was what was important, the following day he could restart the same process again. Yeah? 
And this is such a beautiful way of thinking about life. And this is what I have been talking about here myself before many times as well. We shouldn't focus so much on the results because the results are always uncertain. How long is someone going to live? How long is the monastery going to last? How long am I going to have my job? Will I succeed in my project or not? All of these things are uncertain. Instead, we focus on the process. What kindness can I put into this? What hard qualities can I put into my immediate relationship with the people around me? What these are the things that matter. And when that is what matters, when that is the purpose of your life, then the result is actually starts to become less important. Yeah? And you can deal with it. If it doesn't work out, you can deal with it. Because if it doesn't work out, you have something far more valuable in your heart that we carry with you into the future. That is what you're going to remember in the long term. When you're on your, on your deathbed, you're not going to think so much about whether you succeeded in academia or you succeeded in your job or not. What you're going to recall are the qualities of your heart that you carry with you into the future. So that is the, uh, uh, one of my favorite stories with Ajahn Brahm because it, to me it shows an incredible power and ability to let go and do something which actually almost nobody in this world is capable of doing it. So I was extraordinarily, I was really taken aback when I heard that story. I thought it was really uh, kind of drives home the point uh, of remembering everything dear and agreeable to you must become separated from you, must become otherwise. Yeah? When you remember that all the time, then this becomes your attitude and then you can deal with all the uh, difficulties of life as a consequence. Okay, I'm going to stop <laughs> stop there. So uh, there you are here. Thank you, Ajahn. Can we say three sadhus, uh -huh. please, the Bodhiyana way? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. <laughs> okay, <laughs> excellent. Well done. Uh, so, uh, do we have the questions ready? The question box? Or perhaps we can start out from the audience. Anybody has any questions? Ajahn, actually, maybe um, I can start off. Yeah, please. Um, so in this time where the, uh, we have a climate of fear because of COVID-19, do you mm. have any uh, encouraging words for us or how we should go on with our lives? <laughs> We're having a balance between fear and uh, 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 trying to get on with our lives. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I mean, one of the things about this, uh, one of, I think one of the most important things is to be well informed about these things. Because uh, there's often a lot of the fear comes from social media and the kind of fake news and all these kind of things. Uh, and you can trust so little of what you actually see. And, but when you, I think, look at the reality on the ground, that COVID-19 doesn't seem so incredibly dangerous, you know? It has been, you know, when you get the flu, even just an ordinary flu, there's always a chance of... Uh, dying from a flu, there's always a certain percentage chance. And COVID-19 might be a little bit more dangerous than an ordinary flu, but not that much more dangerous. It's a tiny, even if you get it, the chance of actually it being very serious is actually very, very small. So just be, be well informed about it. I think this is one of, them, one of the first things. Uh, so, uh, so once you have that idea that the chance of dying, a lot of the fear, I think, disappears straight away. Uh, and uh, so that is... Uh, I think one of the most uh, one of the most important things. But apart from that, I think you know everything else I have been saying tonight uh, has kind of been kind of on that topic anyway. Uh, so uh, one of the problems is I just came from Malaysia. I've just been kind of doing this very intensive teachings over there. So I don't have all that much. E my energy is a bit kind of depleted tonight. So I feel a bit sort of <coughs> trying to trying to make my brain work. But uh, so uh, but anyway. So. Yeah, so don't, I mean, the thing about fear is that it has many other things about it as well. When you are fearful, you often make bad decisions. Yeah, this is one of the problems of fear. So you have this general idea in Buddhism, if you want to make a decision about anything, you should never make it when your mind is out of balance, you know, by any defilements or fear or whatever it is. You should, so staying, if you want to make good decisions in life, stay cool, yeah, and, and kind of be, be, be wise about things. Just that memory, that idea that you need to stay cool to make wise decisions already kind of cools you down a little bit. Okay, let me just kind of be, be smart about this uh, and then you can kind of make good decisions. Uh, 
But uh, for me, it is you know the it would take a lot for me to cancel a visit to KL or Singapore just because of some illness. Because uh, I, for me, the idea of monastic life is to do good things. And if I can't do the good things, then that kind of destroys the purpose of monastic life. If I die in the process of doing good things, it's not a big deal. Yeah, you're gonna if you're gonna die, you're gonna die in the best possible way. That would be the best possible way to die. So that's what I how I think about these things. <laughs> so. Uh, Thank you, Ajahn. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll save you from the viruses by handling the papers. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn, for sharing. Some people say that time heals all wounds, but from personal experience, time does not heal. How can we cope with loss if we are haunted by it even years afterwards? Okay, so uh, um, if it doesn't heal, then there would be normally a reason why it doesn't heal. Yeah, There would be something there from the past that is kind of lingering somehow. Maybe some kind of guilt feeling or something which uh, uh, doesn't feel good. So what you have to do then is you have to learn to contemplate that issue in such a way that you can release those feelings. Uh, yeah? This is really the critical thing here. I would think in this case it might, it might be some kind of guilt feeling. It's just a guess I, from the way you put it. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to remember, and again, this comes back to this very basic Buddhist idea, is that uh, uh, very often we are not really, yet when we do things, we're not really in charge of ourselves. We do things because of cause and conditions and all of these kind of things. Uh, so you have to learn about yourself, learn about your own limitations, learn about what you really can do as a human being. Uh, and remember that it is not, even if you feel guilty, it wasn't really, in many ways, it wasn't your fault, what those things that happened. You may have made a mistake, but making mistakes is human. We all make mistakes. And you have to accept yourself for those mistakes, and then let go of it, and then carry on, and have compassion for yourself. If you understand how conditioned you really are as a human being, you will always have compassion for yourself because you know that you are driven towards the problem. You are run towards it through all of these uh, past, maybe even past lives or whatever it is that drive you in that way. And your ability to steer your own life is only so very, very limited. And because of that, you can let go of the guilt feeling here. Yeah? And the beautiful thing about that is if, if you're able to think about your own life in this way, and understand that your, your own limitations with these things, uh, is it giving some bad noise? Or <coughs> if, you, if you hear, if you uh, get this about yourself and you understand the problem with yourself, uh, you also understand other people are in exactly the same boat. And you start to forgive yourself and you forgive others uh, and you actually create a far better life for you as a consequence. Uh, so the critical thing there is to be able to forgive the past, uh, to understand the conditioning of human beings, uh, to understand how we are trapped by our past, trapped by our personality, trapped by our habits. Uh, it's a strange thing to say, trapped by your personality, but that's really what it is. Uh, our personality limits us in a certain way. Yeah, you can't, nobody can step out of your personality, I'm going to be something else. You have to be who you are. It's the only way you can do things. Uh, so it is like a trap. Uh, so because of that, you start to uh, gradually learn to forgive and learn, learn to let go of the past. Uh, if it is something that happened with someone else and they made a mistake and you're haunted by that, similar kind of thing to go through, yeah? Understanding the conditioning process. Uh, and then as you do that, forgiving all sides of the, uh, of the equation uh, and giving, forgiving all sides of the equation and enabling, enabling you eventually to forgive and let go of the whole thing here. Uh. So it's a gradual thing here. Yeah. But here, I think some of the best teachings that we have are actually the Buddhist teachings. Uh, one of the great things about the Buddhist teachings is that you have no idea of a self or a soul which is independent of external phenomena. If you, are, if you have a self or a soul that is independent, you would expect that self or soul to take charge yeah, and do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, the self, yeah, I know what is, I should do the right thing. But if that doesn't exist, uh, if all you are is this conditioned blob in samsara, this boat, dr you know, drifting around the oceans of the world, conditioned this way, conditioned that way, uh, then how much responsibility do you have? Uh? It liberates you from so much of that responsibility. Uh, and it reminds you how important it is to be conditioned in the right way. And you start to understand what you need to do to really carry on in the right direction. Uh. So this, I think, may be the 
answer to your question. I'm not sure exactly, obviously, why you are haunted by the past, uh, but uh, uh, this is just an assumption on my part. Uh, so hopefully that will be, uh, be useful. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, how do you prepare another when she is near death for a good rebirth? Okay. Aye. Okay, excellent. Wonderful. <coughs> How do you prepare someone who is for a good rebirth, who is near death? Um, the best thing is to go to her hospital, go to her bedside and be kind and uh, remind her of all the wonderful qualities in her life. Yeah, And say, wow, I really appreciate these things because uh, uh, it is so rare that we take time to really appreciate each other and make it very detailed, make it very personal, make it come from your heart, yeah, that this is what you really feel about this person. And they will appreciate it enormously if you tell them all you know, about the things that you like about them, the things that have, what they have given you through your life. And it will give them another insight into their own character, which they may not even be aware of themselves. So often we don't know how we touch other people. Yeah? Often we touch people in the most strangest kind of ways, without being really aware that we do that. And when someone tells us about these things, we start to realize the effect of our lives in a positive way. Yeah? And so it's a very powerful thing we can do. And when someone dies with these thoughts in their mind that they have actually been of help to the world, they have done something positive, it will lift their mind up. And that uplifted mind is the kind of mind which goes to a good destination in the future. Don't go to the bedside and cry too much, yeah, because that's not really, <laughs> that it's not very helpful. Go to the bedside instead and tell them these positive things. And ask them if there's anything you can do for them. Yeah, maybe you can do some meditation with them or listen to some chanting together or you can just share a few jokes or whatever it is and ask them if there's anything like that you can do. And keep those Christians out of the, uh, the, the room who want to convert them on the deathbed. Yeah? That's, the, that's kind of the really bad ideas in the world. That makes it very confusing and very hard to, to really know what to do. So that's, I don't think that's very useful at all. So uh, that is the best thing, yeah? And then you encourage them in the right way. And also one of the things you can do, which I, I've been doing recently, I've been doing a guide, guided death meditation when I do retreats. Uh, and I did that also in KL when I was there. And uh, a guided death meditation is a very great way of getting rid of fear of death. Uh, because the death process uh, for a person who has lived a reasonably good life is usually a very happy one. Uh, Towards the end of your life, you are kind of, your body is falling apart and things are shutting down. It's very often very painful and very problematic and you can't really look after yourself yeah? and other people have to do everything for you. It's very, it's very awkward and very kind of uh, difficult in so many different ways. Uh, and then uh, uh, when people kind of get into the idea that dying actually could be a liberating process, uh, where you feel liberated from so much stuff uh, and you take them through a meditation that shows them how that liberation happens, uh, actually it releases so much of the uh, kind of uncertainty, anxiety around death. Uh, of course, death is always going to be some degree of anxiety there because it's kind of it's too unknown. That's why it is so difficult. Uh, but uh, you can take away a lot of that. Uh, so you can kind of go, if you, if you know the stages of dying yourself. You can help them by speaking to them about the stages of dying and saying how it is a release from problems or whatever. Or you can do even a guided death meditation with them yeah, to kind of show them how this, how this works. It was interesting, there was a, one of the participants in KL just now, I, I'm not sure, uh, whoever it was, and he or she, after the meditation, said that, well, I was always so afraid yeah, of dying. My whole life I've been afraid of dying. But in this meditation, I wasn't afraid at all. Did I do something wrong? Yeah? <laughs> was I supposed to be afraid? Yeah, that was kind of the, the question. And of course, that's the whole point. You're not supposed to be afraid. Yeah? It's supposed to release you from that fear to understand that death can be actually a very liberating, beautiful peaceful experience, especially for someone who is, uh, you know, has lived a, a relatively good life and done all the right things. So these are the sort of things that I would uh, uh, recommend you to do, and then you can, actually, you can actually be very supportive of people if you, if you do this, get these things right uh, at the, towards the very end. Okay, Kim. How, 
uh, how can you start being grateful is not easy when you are in negative thought. How can you be grateful when you are in, in, in negative thoughts? Well, you have, to, you have to start gently, yeah, and very kind of carefully with yourself. Uh, and uh, all thoughts are conditioned. It's just a matter of applying yourself, and if you apply yourself in the right way, you will eventually overcome it. You get people in this world who are very angry, and by practicing the Buddha's path, gradually they overcome that anger, and they often end up becoming very kind and gentle people as a consequence. But it's a gradual thing, it takes time, yeah? and this is the thing we have to learn. So that gradualness that is important. Uh, because these are deep-seated habits. Uh, so you have to just start very gently with yourself, yeah? And very uh, knowing your negative minds uh, and uh, then uh, uh, moving towards this kind of idea as I had before about remembering the good qualities, uh, remembering how they have affected you, remembering how they have given you something in your life, uh, yeah? When I think about my own father, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of his qualities, and uh, so many things that I have learned from him, <laughs> He wasn't a Buddhist or anything like that. But sometimes people have natural spiritual qualities. They don't have to be a Buddhist to have spiritual qualities. And he had a lot of kind of this, he was a very, very generous man, for example. Always willing to give. There was never a matter of money or, or anything like that. It was always this incredibly outpouring of generosity towards everyone. And there's such a beautiful quality, yeah? This kind of uh, slightly... Uh, uh, yeah, this kind of broad mind, yeah, which kind of takes in everyone, and everyone is kind of included all the time. Uh, and these are such wonderful things. And then when I eventually become a monk, yeah, he wasn't very happy with that, uh, but eventually he allowed, allowed me to become a monk as well. That was kind of the biggest gift of all, when he allows you to become a monk. Yeah. So all of these things together, when I look back, I learned enormously amounts from my father, and I'm so glad I had them. And those qualities, I carry them with me now. Yeah, they have, kind of in, they have been kind of... Uh, integrated into my personality and hopefully I bring them out and further on into the world. And I think that is what he wanted. He wanted his qualities to be carried on, yeah, through someone else, through his children ideally. And then he would feel really proud of his own life. He wouldn't have lived in vain. And his, uh, the goodness in his life would then carry on into the, into the future. That is what matters. And so this is the way of thinking. Yeah? How can you bring some of those qualities that you are if you are negative mind state, someone is dying, how can you kind of be, uh, make that person proud of what they did? Yeah? Thank you so much, mom. Thank you so much, dad, for helping me in these ways, showing me the world in such a nice way. Now I will carry on that legacy onto future generations again uh, after this. And then you kind of thinking differently. You're looking at the world in a different light uh, and you feel more that gratitude gradually, gradually, gradually. Uh, so you just have to start somewhere, yeah, and never kind of, uh, never give up. And if you find that there are barriers, ask yourself what that, those barriers are, yeah. Why are you, why are they there? And if you start just uh, gradually working on this problem, uh, it will eventually unravel all by itself, uh, and you will find the solutions. The best thing is for you to find the solutions. Uh, yeah, listen to Dhamma talks, take the parts and aspects that work for you. You find the solutions. The solutions that work for you are the ones that you are going to find, not the ones that you just parrot after someone else, uh, because that, isn't, that never has quite the same power uh, in your life. Uh, okay. Thank you, Ajahn. What advice or guidance would you have for someone who's deep in depression, the type where one literally cannot get out of bed or function normally? Okay. So I think uh, in the... Uh, if it, is, if it comes to the point where you can't get out of bed, then uh, you may want to take some medication, yeah, some antidepressants maybe to get you back on track. Yeah. And uh, at least you can function in daily life. There's nothing wrong about taking uh, medication to support you. Everyone sometimes has mental health problems. Yeah? This is just part of life. And there's nothing to feel defeated or shameful about these kind of things. There's still a little bit of stigma in the world for you know, mental illness and these things. And that is unfortunate. But I think we need to try to overcome that so we can deal with these kind of issues. But really, the, the problem with depression is usually just a thought pattern, which is the biggest problem. You get into a negative way of thinking about yourself or thinking about the world, and you get trapped in this kind of endless cycle of negative thoughts. 
you can't get out of it, and because you can't get out of it, you you kind of you kind of repeat the thing again and again and again. So it is uh, very often uh, once you are on medication and you start to understand how your mind works, uh, you can start to undermine that thinking, yeah, that negative thinking to some extent. To start to see why it arises, and you will what you will see is that you are perceiving the world in a certain way, which is dark, yeah, and you need to reprogram your mind to see the world in the better way. What is that better way? And that better way is to remember that if you are, well, this is one way of thinking about it, if you are a good person, yeah, if you are practicing the spiritual life reasonably well, living you know, according to kindness and precepts or whatever, you're on the right track. Yeah? You're heading towards light. You're heading towards something positive. Even if things feel really terrible right now, your future is bright. Yeah? So once you kind of get your mind around the idea that anyone who lives well with kindness and these things, they all have a bright future, then you can start to undermine some of the darkness inside of yourself. You may think this is too good to be true, but actually it, it actually works. Yeah? And because that darkness is always a negativity, usually either about the world or about yourself, that nothing works out, you can't get it right. But uh, overcoming that, uh, understanding that this is the conditioning from the past. Now I'm moving in a different direction because I'm coming to the Buddhist center, I'm listening to Buddhist talks, I'm practicing in the right way. You know that you're heading in the right direction. Uh, the conditioning from the past is what has brought this depression and negativity. Now I'm moving towards light instead. Uh, and by thinking like this, uh, you're gradually kind of, you draw yourself out of these things. It is a I think they sometimes call it cognitive therapy in psychology, but really it's just common sense yeah, that you kind of learn to see things in a positive way. And uh, you, it helps a lot to have a Buddhist practice because then you know that you're actually living, uh, living well at the same time and that kind of enhances your ability to come out of these things. Yeah. Thank you. What advice to give someone with terminal brain cancer who has only a few months to live? Thank you. Okay, someone has terminal brain cancer, okay. Specifically, brain cancer, if it's other cancer, doesn't work, is that, is that right? Or is it yeah? brain cancer? It, yeah. it just says brain cancer. Okay, okay, okay. So if it's, uh, is it is a different advice if it is liver cancer or is it the same advice? Uh, <laughs> same, same advice, so, okay. Let's, let's, let's just say that they have a few months left to live, yeah, that's... But I, I get your point, I'm just messing around a little bit. Uh, so, <coughs> after all, when you are Ajahn Brahm disciple, you are obliged to mess around, mess around a little bit. Uh. So, uh, again, yeah, if you have a few months left to live, that is the time to, very similar to the advice I gave before, uh, is a time to kind of, you know, take stock of your life and to, uh, you know, to remember the good things that you have done and, and all of these kind of things. Of course, if you have a few months left, you also have a little bit of time to do more good as well, yeah, and to kind of, uh, even to, uh, if you can, to, uh, you know, uh, one of the great things about having a few months left to live is that you know there isn't much future. Yeah, and if there isn't much future, it is often so much easier to make your mind peaceful. So it's a good time to learn meditation practice. As many of you will know, one of the greatest problems with meditation practice is the thinking mind. And that thinking mind is very often about the future. You plan, you're thinking about the problems you're going to resolve. But if you have no future, yeah, <laughs> you've got to see the positive in these things. Yeah, I have no future. Okay, so I can, I can sort of just be, be peaceful. And it's true, isn't it? This is why, this is one of the reasons why death contemplation actually works. Because death contemplation is precisely the contemplation that you have no future. So, you know, remind this person, okay, there isn't, you know, you have to be very gentle here, because if you go too hard, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna freak out. But, uh, so you have to be very gentle, but say, you know, actually, you know, this is a good opportunity to learn meditation practice, because your involvement with this world is coming to an end. Yeah, you don't have so much involvement anymore. Because you have less involvement with the world, it means you can be a more peaceful person. So try to use this illness you have to your advantage, where you can kind of stand back a little bit, you can let go a little bit, and you can release yourself from all these involvements, always create more thinking and more problems and endless proliferation in the mind. 
So this is, you know, this is the little advantages of actually being really ill. Ideally, you do this before you get really ill. You get this while you still kind of are, you know, you have many years ahead of you. But this is what you can do at this particular point. And uh, apart from that, you can also do all the other things I, I suggested before about just, uh, you know, how to look after someone who is dying, a similar kind of thing. Uh, but uh, it's fascinating because my, in my family, one of the things that was very interesting when I became a Buddhist monk it was that my family originally, they were very much against it. They thought I was crazy to become a Buddhist monk and all these kind of things. And you can see why, because it's such a different thing from what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I, I don't know what my father had in mind for me, but you know what fathers have in mind for you sometimes. Uh, they kind of have some weird ideas, but so, <laughs> so I, but over time they became very proud of the fact that they had a son who was a Buddhist monk, yeah, it just took time for them to understand what this life really was about. So my parents were on board, my brother was very strongly on board, but he was, he said, oh, I've got too many attachments to be a monk myself, but you can be a monk, yeah, or whatever. <laughs> And, but the only person in my family who was the holdout was my sister, yeah? She was not really interested at all. She was, no way she was going to kind of think about Buddhism or, uh, because she's a kind of worldly person, yeah? Very active and energetic and doing things and all these kind of things, uh, until she got cancer. Uh. And then when she got cancer, suddenly I started getting emails from her, oh, could you please, please send me some, uh, some meditation instruction and things, yeah? That was very interesting because it shows you the power of illness to make you understand the nature of life. When you are face to face with it in your own body, it is as if you have no choice anymore to actually know what is going on. And this is the opportunity for this fellow or, or lady or whatever it is who has uh, brain cancer. It's precisely that opportunity to understand the nature of existence. Now is the chance to actually take a different direction with my life uh, because you understand the limits of existence. Then you can start to become peaceful. Then you can start to build up that good heart inside of yourself. Have more compassion for, your, for the world. Yeah, when you understand the deep suffering of having illness in your own life, you understand every being in the world has to go through the same thing or is already going through the same thing. How can you not have compassion? Yeah, so you have more compassion, you have more care, you have all of these good qualities, you have more peace in your heart, you learn to let go, and bang, you turn the death process into something very beautiful as a consequence. That's the theory. In practice, it is more difficult, of course, but that's kind of the idea, yeah, leaning in that direction. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, this one has two questions. The first one is, how is Buddhist way of defining let go? And second one is, years on, when we think of the deceased, we teared. Does it mean we still have not detached? Okay, so, so the first one was, is what is the attachment? Let, letting go, yes. What is letting go? Uh, letting go is... Uh, precisely the idea of not having attachments, yeah? Letting go means that if you, things don't go your way in the world, you shrug your shoulders and you carry on. That's letting go, yeah? You don't allow things to get to you when things go the wrong way. When you don't, when someone shouts at you or someone kind of does something bad towards you, it's not a big deal for you. You can deal with it. That is letting go, yeah? Letting go is not, is a, yeah. So if you can flow, flow through the world, flow through the ups and downs with an even mind, without being kind of emotionally uh, trapped by all of these things and have all these emotional ups and downs that most people have, if you can do that, uh, then you are letting go basically, going through life in an even way. And that is very worthwhile to be able to go through life in an even way because uh, it's so easy, yeah, it's very kind of comfortable and a very, very nice thing to be able to do. Uh, so. Uh, that is the idea of non-attachment. And you can also think about the idea of non-attachment according to the simile I gave before, about the idea of borrowed goods, yeah? You don't attach to borrowed goods. What you attach to are the things you think you own, or the way you think things should be, yeah? That is also a kind of detachment from the world, another way of thinking about it. So these are different ways of reflecting on that particular idea. 
So if someone has passed away a long time ago and you're still kind of tearing up sometimes, don't worry too much about that. Yeah, it is. Remember, this is not either about letting go a hundred percent or being attached a hundred percent. It's about a path. It's about a movement. So if you are finding that you are detaching slowly, then you are on the right track. Don't expect it to be perfect. If you expect it to be perfect, you're asking for too much. It is okay to get emotional sometimes. Yeah, everyone gets emotional sometimes, and that's it's perfectly all right. But to get the feeling that you are heading in the right direction, that it is over time, gradually you are releasing it, yeah, and it's kind of uh, going over time, then you are on the right track. Yeah. There's no kind of magic bullet, bang, it's gone. It is always a gradual practice, gradual training, yeah, and that is actually the best way of doing things. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know, if you feel that you still have too many attachments and it's too difficult to let go, then again you just have to ask yourself, why? Yeah, Do some forgiveness ceremony with a person who's passed away. It is often very powerful if you can ask and give forgiveness. I do this at all the funeral services I do. And I say to people, close your eyes and now ask for forgiveness. Because very often the person, if they are still there, yeah, they will hear that forgiveness that you ask from them. So you can do that also if the person has passed away. Ask forgiveness. Give them forgiveness. Yeah? Do an act of merit on their behalf. Remember their good qualities. Send them some metta. <coughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> <laughs> life is uncertain yeah I told you life very uncertain <laughs> so be careful so uh, yeah <laughs> so this is, this is the way of then gradually overcoming this yeah and move trying to move away so all of these are little techniques and, uh, and uh, see what that does for you and uh, yeah okay thank you Ajahn how do as you how do you assist sibling that doesn't care of mom having detect dementia? I guess it means how do you uh, talk to a sibling that doesn't care about your mother who uh -huh. has dementia? Uh, and then it goes on as mom miss all of these siblings, but they doesn't see is important. So I suppose it means um, uh, the the mom misses all of these siblings, but they don't see her as important. Uh, the, the, the mum so the, the mum sees, sees the siblings as important, not the other way around. Is that what you say? It's the 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 but yeah. the I think it's the siblings that don't see the mum as important, and yeah. this is the yeah. time she needs them now because she's got dementia. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, okay, uh, yes, and uh, this is very common problem. <laughs> You know, that there is uh, some people who care more, other people who care less. Very, very common thing. And uh, the, the main thing about other people is that they are very hard, very hard to control. Yeah, And if you try to change someone else, very often you end up being very uh, distressed because people don't change. And then you get upset and then it gets worse and they get frustrated and it doesn't really work out. So you have to remember that if you want to what you really should want to do is to help your siblings rather than to fault find with them. Yeah, This is a big difference. So if your sibling has a problem but you feel upset about it, that they don't do their, their part of the thing, that is actually maybe, in some sense, that is your problem. Yeah, Because uh, it is not really the right way to think about it. If the sibling doesn't do the job, actually they are the ones who have the problem because they are the ones who don't understand that this is the time your mother reads help. Yeah? And they actually, in a sense, are far worse than you, in a far worse position than you are, because you understand the importance of looking after your old mother. So in a sense, you are streets ahead anyway. So don't fall fine with your siblings in the first place. That's going to make it worse. But what you can do, the right way, is really to have some compassion for your siblings. Because if they don't understand the importance of looking after their own mother, then there's something missing inside of them, yeah? something missing in their heart. That shouldn't really be the case. We should all look after our parents when they get old. In every society this is true. I know that in some East Asian societies it's kind of considered you know, filial piety and all that, but it's actually true in all societies. It doesn't make that much difference. So uh, something is missing. And so what you have to remind them is that this is your opportunity to kind of pay back some of your debt or gratitude to your parents 
remind them of all the things that parents have done for you. Yeah, as it says in the suttas, the Buddha talks about this. And then get a sense of gratitude or at least compassion for your mother to rise in your siblings. And then maybe they will change their mind. Maybe they will come out. Remind them that your mum is not going to be around forever. If she already has dementia, how long is it going to last before she's dead? Yeah? Now is your last chance to look after her and to support her. Take the opportunity. When she's gone, you're going to regret it badly afterwards if you don't take the opportunity as it is now. So little things like that. But it has to come from, don't give them a guilt feeling. Yeah? Don't blame them. If you blame them, there's no chance they're going to listen to you. They will only listen to you if they feel that you are saying it in the, for their own, um, uh, in, out of compassion and out of the best interest of your, your siblings. Then they might listen to you. But if they feel that you're just coming from anger and you, kind of, you, have your, uh, you, you, know, you are just out there to, to get them or whatever, there's no way they're going to listen to you. So you have to be wise about this. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to work out. Uh. And probably you are also a bit upset because a lot of the workload then falls on you. Yeah, this is kind of typical as well. And it's natural enough to get a bit upset. Uh, but remember that uh, if your siblings are not doing their job, in a sense, it is an opportunity for you as well to, uh, to kind of help out. Your helping out becomes far more important if your siblings aren't doing their job. Yeah? Suddenly, your help becomes like uh, uh, massively important. Uh, so remember that. And uh, it's fascinating, uh, even though someone may have Alzheimer's or, or dementia in a very uh, bad way, uh, sometimes there's something underneath there that will know that you are supporting them. Uh, don't think it is all in vain. Don't think you are supporting without getting any kind of gratitude back. Yeah? Remember, when the person eventually dies, when your mum eventually dies, uh, her mind will be released from that body. Uh, and the moment she gets released from that body, she will know that you have been looking after her all this time. Yeah? Because then her mind becomes clear again. And she will have tremendous gratitude for you. So do it with a good heart. Remember that this often has impact on the subconscious level beyond that demented mind, or brain rather, demented brain, which is sick and cannot function anymore. Behind that, there's something which very likely appreciates what you're doing. Yeah, and then you can build up the sense of compassion. You can get more feeling for what, that you're doing something really useful. It's not something which isn't uh, appreciated. Actually, it probably is appreciated in a very deep way. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, book which I read many years ago called the... Uh, uh, oh, my mind is blurry, but... Uh, <coughs> What is it called again? Irreducible mind. It's a book about a kind of phenomena of the mind, which shows that the mind is something apart from the physical body. And one of these uh, phenomena, I don't know if Dr. Kim will know anything about this, but uh, in uh, some of the uh, geriatric institutions around the world, where doctors work with, with old patients all the time, uh, apparently it is quite common for someone with Alzheimer's disease a certain percentage, I don't know, two or three percent or whatever, of these Alzheimer patients, at the very end, just before they are about to die, they become clear. They may have had Alzheimer's for 10 years, 20 years, whatever, but the last 10 minutes before they die, they kind of, whoa, oh, hi, hello, son, hello, daughter, yeah, how are you? Oh, we haven't spoken for about 20 years, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and that is astonishing and that is that shows you that this idea that you get released from the body at the very end actually makes sense this is not really explainable this kind of phenomenon is not explainable according to modern uh, medical science uh, yeah because it doesn't make any sense because the mind is supposed to be a byproduct of the brain and all these kind of things but from a buddhist point of view it makes eminent sense at this particular point uh, your mind is starting to release from the body, and as it releases from the Alzheimer's mind, it gets independent again, and is able to function without, beyond that brain. Yeah? And this is what is happening there. And in the same way, when, you, when your mother eventually dies, something similar is going to happen. And then uh, you will know that you have done something very useful, because she can then have that gratitude of having had a daughter or son who has really looked after their mother, uh, and w whereas maybe the siblings didn't do their job uh, to, to the same standard. Uh, okay. 
Ajahn, absolutely. I think it's called uh, near death lucidity or something. It's well documented. Yeah, look, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, last one. How do you try to move on from a romantic attachment, especially when it hurts to see someone you can't have every day? How do you overcome the pain? Uh, Ajahn is not married, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, would be, that would be really disappointing, wasn't it? If I, if I actually was married, that would really be interesting. Oh. <laughs> no. So... Uh, yeah, so how do you move away from a romantic relationship, especially if... Especially when it hurts to see someone you can't have every day. Okay. Uh, how do you overcome the pain? If you, if you can't have them, but they are kind of they're, they're there, yeah, how do you overcome it? Uh, yeah, this <laughs> Why do you think we're not married? I mean, you know, this is kind of <laughs> this is the obvious answer. This is life. Yeah, this is exactly what it is. This is the this is the problem. This is this is you know you cannot you will always be separated from what is dear and pleasing to you. This is this is it. This is how this is how it goes. And uh, life is full of that. I've been there. I know what it feels like. Yeah, yeah. a long time ago now, but I, you can still kind of remember what it's like, sort of. Uh, so uh, this is the problem. And of course, every time you get into a relationship, you are asking for the same kind of trouble again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are. This is, the, this is the thing. So there is the high, but with the high comes the low. And this is the... Uh, this is sangsaric existence. It's, this is why it is so harsh. Yeah. This is why it is so incredibly harsh, this sangsaric existence. Uh, every time you have a high in sangsara, every time you bond with something, every time you're attached to something, whenever you're attached, you're saying, please, suffering, come and come at any time and uh, torture me. That's what you're saying. Yeah, this is the reality of things. And uh, the better that relationship is, the more difficult it is when it's going to come to an end. Some relationships are terrible, not really worth having in the first place, so there's no point. But the good ones, they're going to end in, you know, end in tears, usually, at the very latest when someone dies. So it is very hard. And this happens to almost everybody. Yeah, everybody has these kind of problems. So you have to, uh, what do you have to do? In the long run, you have to build up that inner resilience again. That inner resilience will enable you to deal with the impermanence and the problems of the world. You build up that inner independence, qualities inside of you, or happiness and peace and, and all of these things, which makes it at least easier for you to deal with those breakups when they eventually happen. It will still be painful, but it will be less painful. You will be stronger. You will be able to kind of, you know, to... To, uh, to, to deal with it in a better way. Uh, and that is really the, uh, uh, the critical thing there. Uh. So you have to take a long-term strategy, become a more independent person in this world. Uh. And that is one of the things I really love about the uh, spiritual path, is that it makes you independent. Uh, yeah? It makes you free from all of these external things outside. Uh. And those people I see who I admire the most for having walked a long way on the Buddhist path, people like Ajahn Brahm, well, people like the Buddha, yeah, number one, of course. The Buddha, <coughs> Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Ganaha, who I've talked about before here, maybe Lumpur Liam, the abbot of Wat Pan Pong, some of these monks who are really exceptional, yeah, and there are nuns like that also, uh, you know, uh, who are practiced really well, like the abbot of Dhammasara Monastery, Venerable Hasapanya, who comes here, she's actually a very capable nun, I'm really impressed with her, uh, and uh, she's a very plucky and very courageous nun. Uh, and uh, so uh, you, uh, <coughs> when you see them, you realize they are extremely independent people. They don't care what anything else, anyone else says. If the whole world says go to the right, if they know it's right to go to the left, they will go to the left instead. They don't care what anyone else thinks. And this is what happens on the spiritual path. You gain that independence. As long as you haven't got that independence, uh, you're always going to be subject to these kind of problems. Yeah? And there is, uh, you can do cosmetic things, you can avoid that person not to have to see them and to see what you might have had if possible. Or maybe you can't avoid them because maybe they work in the same place as you. I don't know, maybe it's really hard. Maybe you have to change your job because it's too painful to work there. I don't know, you can do cosmetic things like that. Uh, but the problem is, cosmetic things is just a temporary solution. You think you find a solution, but actually you haven't found a solution at all. That's really the problem. Every time we, we, we have a temporary solution, we think that we have now solved it, but actually we haven't. And it comes back again, yeah, to haunt us again in the future. And uh, 
until eventually you start to understand, I need to do something more profound. And that more profound thing is to focus more on the process, less on the result. Remember Ajahn Brahm in that fire, let go of everything, bang, like that. Tomorrow I will start from scratch. No regrets, nothing at all, yeah? The relationship is over with this person you are in love with. Gone, yeah? Tomorrow morning, another person. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that sounds a bit sounds a bit harsh, but you you, you, you get you get the idea, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so good luck. That's all I can say because it's these are these are precisely you know I, <laughs> one of the things that uh, I have kind of wriggled my way out of those problems. You see, this is kind of the uh, the advantage. Uh. Thank you, Ajahn. That's all for the written questions. Anybody has got any uh, last minute uh, burning questions? Uh, last minute written pieces of papers. Okay, so uh, if we don't, uh, can we say three sadhus again to Ajahn? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, very good. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you all. I just want to say, I, today, tonight I didn't have much energy. I'm trying, trying my very best, but uh, sometimes the energy is a bit down, so I don't know how this came out, but hopefully it was useful. Shall we end up by saying Arahang Samasambodo? Yes, let's do that at the very end. Yeah.